People have been trying to communicate secrets for thousands of years. But honestly, until only recently, they weren't very good at it. From Spartans wrapping messages around sticks, to Julius Caesar shifting letters in the alphabet. History is full of clever sounding tricks that just don't hold up today. What once looked unbreakable can now be cracked in seconds with a computer, or by looking at it the right way. Hi and welcome to Premature Abstraction. In this video, we're going to walk through some of the oldest ciphers in history, see how they were broken, and how they connect to each other. The Skitterly cipher is one of the oldest examples of encryption. It was used in ancient Sparta around 500 BCE to secretly deliver messages between parties. To send a secret message, a strip of parchment or leather was wound tightly around a rod of secret diameter. The sender would then write the message lengthwise across the wrapped strip. When the strip was unwound, the letters appeared scrambled and unreadable. Only someone with a rod of the same diameter could wrap the strip again and read the message correctly. We can visualize it like this. Write the text in a grid, the number of rows representing the rod circumference, and then the encrypted text is read off column-wise. One small side note. Throughout this video, I will only use uppercase English words without punctuation or caring about white space because it makes the animations clearer. In reality, they would of course be included in the alphabet and encrypted like any other letter. You can imagine that breaking the cipher is not that hard. Generally, it is easy to detect that this encryption method was used because the letters themselves don't change, only their order. This is why it's called a transposition cipher. So if the attacker knows the frequency distribution of the letters in the message, they can simply check if the cipher text still has the same distribution. Then attacking the cipher itself is also straightforward. The most basic idea is brute forcing the key, which means trying all possible keys until known words are recognized. Luckily, there can only be as many different keys as the message is long. We can automate the search by using an English dictionary. In this example, you can see all words highlighted that appear in the dictionary. And when we find matches for most of the text, this is likely the correct key. You can see breaking this cipher is not hard at all. In fact, it is so easy that there is still some debate whether the Skitly cipher was even used for encryption, or rather as a message authentication code, the idea being that it is hard to forge a valid message for a specific receiver as the attacker would need to know the diameter of the rod being used, even though the message content itself is not really protected. Of course, this depends more on obscurity than actual security, because as soon as the attacker knows what's going on, they can just determine the rod diameter by trial and error when given a cipher text and start forging messages. Probably the most famous historical encryption method is the Caesar cipher. It was used in ancient Rome around 50 BCE. Encryption works by shifting all letters in the plain text by a specific number of positions in the alphabet. And then decryption, of course, by shifting the same amount backwards. It may be important to note that technically the Caesar cipher was only a special variant of this, namely always shifting three times. This makes it an unkeyed cipher, which is already a red flag for secrecy. The variant with a specific shift key is usually called shift cipher, but the terms shift cipher and Caesar cipher are often used interchangeably, and we will do the same. Anyways, attacking even the keyed version is very easy. There are only so many letters in the alphabet, so we can simply brute force all keys until we get words from our dictionary. So there is a slight generalization to this, namely that we don't just shift all letters by the same amount, but instead we map each letter to a different one without any specific rule. This renders at least brute force infeasible because there are so many permutations for mapping the alphabet. In fact, the key space size is factorial in the alphabet size, so brute force is not an option anymore, even for smallish alphabets. But it is still just one fixed mapping for all the letters in the alphabet. That's why this method and the Caesar cipher are both called monoalphabetic substitutions. And since we only relabeled the letters, the underlying frequencies of the letters remain the same, making it vulnerable to a frequency attack. Given a long enough encrypted message, we count all the letters. And 
and then compare the distribution to the one of the underlying language, matching the frequencies of the two distributions. This way we can just undo the substitution. The previous two ciphers cannot really be considered secure, and their limitations must have also been known to their ancient users. But the next one, the Viginaire cipher, was actually believed to be secure for centuries. It was first published in the 16th century and then only broken about 300 years later, while being called Le Chiffre Indechiffrable, the indecipherable cipher. And that's even though the idea is not much more complex than that of the Caesar cipher. Instead of shifting each letter the same amount, we shift each letter individually. This is why the Viginaire cipher substitution is called polyalphabetic. The secret key is, of course, the individual number of shifts. Usually, the key is mapped back to the alphabet to have it as a readable word, but that's not strictly necessary. And if the key is too short for the message, we just repeat it. This key repetition is the fatal flaw in the algorithm. It will be crucial for breaking it, so keep that in mind. But first, we have a look why we can't attack the cipher the same way as the monoalphabetic substitution. When we count the letter frequencies from our ciphertext again, we can see that it is completely different from the distribution of English text. It even looks almost uniform. This is because the individual shifts obfuscated any information contained in the text. You can think of it like this. It could have been any plain text message. Because given some specific ciphertext, there is exactly one key to decrypt to any specific plain text. And when the key was chosen completely at random, the probability for any original plaintext remains the same before and after the attacker observed the ciphertext. That means there is no way of inferring any information from that, and so it is impossible to break. This property is called perfect secrecy, and we will take a look at that in a future video. But as we already said, the key may not be completely uniformly random, but usually repeats a bunch of times. Having a repeated key means that there is some step size at which all letters are shifted by the same amount. So in grouping them, we know that each group on its own is effectively only encrypted by the Caesar cipher. Of course, we don't know the length of the key at first, but similar to the Skitterly cipher, there can only be so many. So the first part of the attack is guessing the key length. For this, we can make use of the index of coincidence technique. Without going too much into detail here, the idea is that the underlying language of the plain text has a characteristic number, namely the probability that two randomly chosen letters from a text are the same. We can calculate it like this, where 26 is the alphabet size as a normalization factor. Capital N is the text length, and NI the counts of how often each letter appears in the text. If all letters are equally likely, this index is exactly one. But for monocase English, it is rather 1.73. And the important insight here is that this number is the same even after applying a substitution, as this effectively only means relabeling the letters without actually changing anything about the letter frequencies themselves. Knowing this, we can just try all possible key lengths. That means building the groups and calculating the average index of coincidence over all groups for a given key length. For the correct one, we will get a high index of coincidence close to 1.73. With key length 6, we finally found it. You can see that the IC for key length 3 was also quite high. So if you want to be sure that you found the correct one, you can just continue calculating the ICs because any multiple of the correct key size also has a high IC. Last, knowing the key length, we can just attack each group individually with the same methods as for a Caesar cipher. Overall we saw that all of these ciphers on their own are not really secure. However, their underlying techniques, transposition and substitution, are fundamental building blocks of modern algorithms, for example, for AES. This has been Premature Abstraction. Thank you for watching.